Okay, as it's been a few minutes now, I'm just going to begin with the introductions and housekeeping for today's session. So welcome everyone once again to this webinar hosted by Trace and WWF Singapore. We're really glad that you could join us. Um, today's webinar is Towards Sustainable Finance in Asia, Deforestation and Due Diligence. And um, we're really glad that you could join us today. So before I move on to introduce the speakers, I'd just like to cover a few housekeeping points. Um, so just to let you know, we'll have presentations from the speakers, and this will be followed by a Q&A session uh, in the second half of the webinar. Please post any questions that you have in the Q&A box throughout the presentations. Um, you can also use the chat box, and we will be answering them during the Q&A session later. Uh, also, to let everybody know, this webinar is being recorded. We will be sharing the recording later with registrants and also uploading it to YouTube and sharing it um, through our various channels. If there are any media present who want to work on stories to do with um, deforestation risk, uh, Trace will be very happy to speak to you. So please contact media at trace.earth if you have any queries. Um, I think that's probably more appropriate than discussing it in this in the Q and A here. But um, yeah, please feel free to get in touch with us. Uh, so those are the housekeeping points. Um, very happy now to introduce our speakers for today. Um, I realize I haven't introduced myself as well, so I'm your moderator for today. Uh, my name is Jolene Tan. I'm the communications lead at Trace um, and Global Canopy. And the three speakers that we have giving presentations are Ashish Sharma, who is Vice President for Asia Sustainable Finance at WWF Singapore. Ben Levitt, who is a researcher with Trace and NeuroAlpha. And Joanne Lee, who is the Responsible Investment Specialist at First Centier Investors. Uh, not pictured here, but um, someone who will be helping us to answer questions uh, in the chat box and in the Q&A box is the Trace Research Associate, Mark Titley, who will be taking questions that have to do with the nature of trace data. Um, and uh, so the other questions we will be discussing live in the Q&A. Uh, great, so that was the introductions for today. Uh, very pleased once again to have everybody here. And uh, to kick us off, we will be hearing from Ashish, who will be discussing findings from WWF Singapore's Sustainable Banking Assessment, or SUSBA. So please take it away, Ashish. Thanks a lot, Jolene. Um, just give me a second while I share my screen. Um, uh, can you hear me okay? Perfect. Um, so good morning and good evening, everyone. Um, thank you very much uh, for, for joining this call. Uh, as Jolene mentioned, I'm part of the sustainable finance uh, um, group in uh, WWF Singapore, where I work in the banking group. And uh, what we do is um, work with banks primarily in Asia to help them improve their environmental and social practices. And in order to do that, um, we have a framework where we uh, look at uh, banks within the region uh, across a number of indicators covering their strategy, their policies, processes, people, products, and portfolio. And we use these assessments as an engagement tool to work with banks to see where they are and how they can improve going forward. Uh, complementing this uh, overall assessment, we've also started looking at sector-based deep dives uh, for sectors that we think are important, um, not only within uh, the global context, but specifically in Asia. So uh, in addition to uh, energy, we also look at palm oil given uh, that it's a huge uh, driver of deforestation in the region. And this is something I wanna talk about a bit more uh, over the next couple of slides. We've also uh, introduced, uh, we, uh, uh, you might see seafood as a, as a third um, sector we've uh, focused on this year. Um, I won't be talking much about that, but I'll share a report uh, at the end of this presentation so you can get an overall uh, sense of the findings. So um, uh, as I mentioned, we just released our uh, latest assessment based on 46 banks in Asia. And uh, the two key findings which are uh, related to the topic we are discussing today that I wanted to go through are on this page. The first one is really uh, pointing out the need for banks to improve um, their coverage, not just uh, to their clients, 
within the palm oil uh, sector in the upstream sector, but also look at uh, the entire supply chain. So look at uh, midstream players, downstream players, as well as, well as retail to see where their footprint is. And this is one big gap that we see within the, uh, the banks and their coverage. Uh, the second big gap that I wanted to talk about was uh, the importance of looking at uh, client supply chains, which I, uh, I know we'll be also hearing uh, from Trace uh, on their solutions. But what we really see is that banks given their history, uh, tend to focus just on their immediate clients. Uh, and that, that is um, uh, something that they have to change given that uh, a, lot of the, um, a lot of their policies, if they are not covering the entire supply chain, uh, tend to cover just their direct larger uh, clients. Uh, and, and that leaves a lot of leakage uh, that needs to be uh, addressed. The second point that I'd like to cover uh, is uh, a broader topic around nature related risks. and Within our overall assessment, uh, we pulled out a number of indicators which uh, relate to nature. And what we find is that uh, the discussion on climate is progressing, but on nature, um, banks are acknowledging the risks, uh, but they're not really asking their clients to do much about it. Uh, and, and here again, uh, we are working with banks to see how they can, number one, identify the main nature-related risks, but also come up with uh, client requirements to, to ask the clients to address these risks. So I'll talk a little bit about that as well. Uh, so uh, over the next couple of pages, I'll just talk uh, about palm oil specifically in our sector deep dive. Uh, and on the slide, what you can see is that uh, we've assessed uh, uh, these 46 banks across Asia across uh, our 38 uh, sub-indicators. Uh, and what you can see is that most, uh, I mean, most banks in uh, ASEAN really don't uh, score very well, uh, other than Singapore, which scores at about 40% of uh, the, the sub-indicators. Uh, most of the other banks are, are well below 25%. Um, although we've seen some improvement in 2022 versus 2021, particularly in Singapore, Malaysia, and Japan, there's still a lot of room uh, to be um, uh, for improvement. And uh, this is really critical given uh, a lot of regulations, particularly the one in, in Europe uh, regarding deforestation-free commodities, uh, which is going to become uh, a, an issue for a lot of the uh, clients in this sector to comply with. So uh, I guess uh, what I'd like to do in the next slide is really go through our palm oil assessment framework to really point out what the key gap is. So the way we run our uh, sector assessments is we look at uh, the overall bank commitments, which is the first three uh, uh, overall indicators here around strategy, purpose and scope, disclosure, reporting and monitoring, where we look at uh, you know, whether a bank, for example, uh, acknowledges the importance of deforestation, whether they have uh, specific sector policies for uh, palm oil, uh, whether they disclose the emissions related to their palm oil sector, whether they disclose um, uh, perform like uh, certification um, uh, compliance of their palm oil portfolios, uh, whether they have uh, client specific processes to to monitor these clients as well as engage with them. So that's the first three sector. Uh, um, indicators. And here what we find is in general, uh, banks are putting in palm oil uh, policies, which is great. On the disclosure side, uh, what we found is that a lot of banks are, pro you know, given that they're focusing on high emitting sectors, are disclosing uh, the profile of their, their larger uh, portfolios in energy and transport, but really haven't gotten to uh, agriculture and palm oil yet. So that's something we've been working with them on. And on uh, monitoring and reporting, uh, many of the banks in, in uh, ASEAN do have, uh, have put in a, 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 a framework where they assess every client and they engage with them if they're not compliant with their policies. What we really find is the issue is in indicators four through eight. Uh, and I'll talk a bit about this. Uh, uh, what we see is whether they have policies for their ups for the upstream palm oil sector. So this would be commitments uh, on no deforestation, whether they have policies for uh, uh, no burning, uh, things like no planting on peat, uh, FPIC, et cetera. And, and here, uh, what we find is even though some clients have put in policies around no deforestation, very often it tends to be encouragement. So it's not a hard requirement. And we are asking banks to, to make this a hard requirement as we go forward. But the real gap shows up on indic indicator number five, where we ask uh, clients whether 
their no deforestation policy also extends to third party suppliers that, that supply into the palm oil companies. And here we find, like I mentioned before, banks really don't have the wherewithal or the tools to really track the suppliers of their clients. And this creates a big problem because we know, uh, for example, in the palm oil sector, uh, you have a large client, they might have a mill on site, but they might be sourcing uh, you know, palm oil kernels from, from other third party suppliers. And we wanna make sure that the policies cover that as well, especially given that we have a uh, new regulation coming up, uh, which mandates particularly for exports into Europe that uh, palm oil be certified as deforestation free. What we also find in uh, number six and number seven is very few banks have policies uh, relating to uh, the downstream sectors, right? Whether it's refining and trading or retail. Uh, and in order to, to tackle this uh, issue, we really need to uh, take a holistic view of this whole thing, uh, of the whole, uh, the entire sector. So what we are recommending banks to do uh, uh, is number one, um, uh, require palm oil um, uh, companies across the value chain to, to commit to NDPE as well as certification and help their clients build the supply chain traceability tools, which we'll hear about uh, more today. Um, the, the third uh, recommendation really comes out from our overall banking assessment, where we find a lot of banks have started assessing risks at um, uh, for the climate-related uh, issues, so physical and transition risk related to climate. But what we're asking them to do is to also do uh, specific um, uh, assessments for nature-related risks and also for the social elements like human rights. And lastly, improving disclosures as well. So uh, given that I'm out of time, I'll speak very briefly about the nature-related risks, and I'll only make one point here. We have several indicators where we look at nature-related risks uh, within our overall SASPA indicators, and what we find is that banks have started acknowledging these risks. So this might, these might be biodiversity, deforestation, water-related risks, as well as marine-related risks, but they are still very early in setting client expectations in, for clients in these sectors to really uh, action these risks. So um, that's another big ask for banks to, to start prioritizing the, the bigger nature related risks in their portfolio and putting together policies to address that. So with that, uh, Jolene, I'd hand it back to you. Uh, thank you. Thanks very much, Ashish, um, for that really interesting presentation and really helpful for us to get a sense of what's happening in the uh, banking sector in Asia on this front. Uh, I see there's already some comments and questions coming through in the chat. Just to let everybody know, uh, we're not ignoring your questions. We will be answering them in the Q&A, but we're just going to finish the presentations first, and then we'll be able to discuss in light of, of those presentations. Um, so following on, uh, our second speaker for today is Ben Levitt from Trace and Neuro Alpha. And Ben will be talking about um, deforestation, due diligence, and what sort of data and tools are available to, to support processes around that. So over to you, Ben. Yeah, thanks, Jolene, and thanks, everyone, for joining us today. Um, if we go to the first slide, please. Thanks. Uh, so before diving into nature-based due diligence, uh, what it is, why it's so important for financial institutions, and what a good data-driven process looks like, I'll briefly introduce the TRACE project for those that aren't familiar with it. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so TRACE is a science-based initiative that aims to bring transparency to the international trade and financing of the agricultural commodities that drive the vast majority of tropical deforestation. Uh, Trace's deforestation data draws on satellite images and crop mapping to determine where natural habitats are converted and replaced by commodity production. Using shipment data, information on where companies own assets and other data such as uh, tax and transport records, Trace has been able to allocate production volumes uh, from these regions of production to specific exporters and importers. Together, this provides the most detailed picture yet of how supply chains are linking commodity flows and associated deforestation risks from regions of production via traders to countries of import. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, Trace Finance then adds a finance layer on top of that, uh, resolving organizations to their legal entities with associated financial IDs, mapping the legal hierarchies from traders from ultimate parents to subsidiaries, uh, drawing links between traders and any external, often high risk joint ventures. It provides transparency uh, to how financial institutions are exposed to that risk through various financial instruments 
and it offers FIs the data tools for them to apply that analysis to their own portfolio information or screening exercises. Uh, Trade, Trade Finance has uh, been working the last couple of months to bring together a due diligence specific data set that aims to help streamline the uh, decision process through a combination of flags and metrics. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so why uh, deforestation and nature-based due diligence and why has it become such a hot topic for financial institutions? Uh, next slide, thanks. Uh, we're all familiar with the sheer scale of deforestation seen in recent decades and the effect it's had. Uh, despite this, up until maybe the last couple of years, it's been a huge blind spot for ESG, not just in terms of uh, often grossly underestimating the scope three emissions and degree of climate target alignment in the sector, but also in terms of ignoring the huge importance of biodiversity and ecosystem health, uh, as well as the link to human rights issues. A uh, recent share action survey, for instance, concluded that only 10% of asset managers had a dedicated biodiversity policy, while Forest 500 finds that around 60% of tractifiers still have inadequate deforestation policies for lending and investment, uh, providing some three and a half trillion in finance to high forest risk organizations. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so why is that changing? Um, arguably a combination of push and pull factors. Uh, FIs are increasingly recognising that being a responsible investor means more than just focusing on narrow climate targets, even if action to date has been limited and patchy, as we've just heard. Uh, the very real material risks attached to overly narrow screening, in, in particular in connection to greenwashing, are also becoming very prominent, uh, bringing not just reputation risks, but also compliance risk. Uh, and as recent examples show, once on a regulator's radar, resulting organisation level risk often amplify. At the same time, best practice frameworks such as TNFD are taking form and creating momentum behind the push for nature-based reporting. Finally, and most importantly, uh, regulations are stepping up both sides of the Atlantic, uh, most significantly with the EU deforestation-free supply chain to carbon kicking in from 2024, uh, removing the need for illegality, the particular game changer there. Inclusion of financial institutions within that remit is under consultation, but it's clear that even without that explicit inclusion, the policy has strong implications for the need to conduct specific KYC and usual screening to avoid being associated with non-compliant organisations and avoid taking on underpriced credit risk. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, when and where should deforestation students be used? Uh, next slide. Um, so the idea of extending traditional anti-money laundering and fraud uh, due diligence is already fairly mainstream when it comes to enforcing exclusion policies, for instance, over coal financing. Uh, Nature-based studio aims to take that a step further, incorporating deforestation and biodiversity risk assessment from the off. Uh, crucially, this should uh, apply not only to project finance, uh, investment management screening and bank lending, but also into investment banking and service provision. Uh, arguably, these book runners and loan managers have some of the greatest leverage when it comes to shaping nature positive finance, but also some of the uh, weakest screening processes currently in place. Uh, next slide. Uh, how can data help in that decision making process? Um, next slide, please. Uh, Trace Finance looks to replicate the filtering process of a well organized usual process by offering flags and uh, associated metrics. Flags could be triggered at several stages of the process, from high-level flags that identify high or, rel or relative uh, deforestation risk through to location-specific flags linked to sourcing from highest regions, through to policy and reporting flags such as poor scores for supply chain transparency. These flags can then highlight the need for further detailed assessment. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the advantage of trace data for risk assessment is that it enables analysis at various levels of abstraction depending on data availability. Uh, country commodity analysis combined with other sources such as the soft commodity footprint project uh, allow for broad generic risk grading based on very uh, basic sourcing breakdowns, maybe directing FIs where to seek extra information through questionnaires. For traders, total deforestation risk can be assessed with peer rankings alongside more detailed breakdowns of sourcing, sourcing profiles. And for traders in fast-moving consumer gum, uh, good companies that and producers that provide mill lists in the case of introducing palm, for example, we are currently trialling data that links risks down to the asset levels where possible, uh, valuable for understanding operation level risks uh, as recommended by TNFD, and for designing mitigation and engagement strategies right from day one. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, as part of this project, colleagues at Global Canopy will be publishing guidance on deforestation and due diligence in the next couple of months that aims to distill best practice down to four key stages that can then look to leverage data from Trace Finance, Forest IQ and others. 
Uh, stage one is focused on profiling, uh, understanding who the company is, what risk sectors and locations it operates in, what subsidiaries are part of its group and where risk resides, along with certifications. Uh, stage two is about screening. Uh, is it high risk for certain biomes? Does it have a record for fines or complaints? What level of deforestation risk uh, does it have and how does it perform for commitments and reporting? Uh, stage three is then location specific. Uh, does it have high percentages of sourcing for, from hotspot locations or is it low risk with uh, particular pockets in from certain locations? Um, can that risk be linked to particular refineries or mills? Does the company have uh, too high a share of indirect sourcing uh, and it is, is its traceability performance poor versus peers, for example? And finally, stage four, the decision, which is importantly not just about yes or no, but also about considering relevant conditions that might be attached. Uh, this stage should already be about using usual location specific research to inform ongoing management, how KPIs might be attached to a loan agreement, for instance, or what voting and engagement strategy might be adopted in the case of an investment to tackle the identified weaknesses. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, to end on a positive note, uh, there's great potential for uh, enlightened self-interest from FIs to drive really positive change. Uh, Nature-based due diligence can help embed that ethos, as well as to address some of the criticisms of green finance seen in recent years. Um, yeah, thanks very much. And uh, if anyone wants to dig into any more of the details, then I would uh, like recommend uh, checking out one of the Trace Explainer webinars, uh, looking at the Trace Finance website, uh, and getting in touch if interested in trialling uh, any of the data sets mentioned today. Thanks. Thanks very much, Ben. Uh, and uh, I see that some questions are starting to come in, so please keep them coming because we will have plenty of time to discuss this in more detail after the presentations. Um, and so uh, after that from Ben, we're now going to move to the third speaker for today's presentations. Joanne Lee from First Centier Investors is going to talk a bit about First Centier Investors' approach to understanding and managing deforestation. So uh, please, Joanne. Thank you, Jolene. Uh, thanks everyone uh, for being here and, and thank you for the organizers for inviting First Center investors um, to present and share our lessons learned and uh, our journey so far on deforestation. Uh, my name is Joanne Lee. I'm the Responsible Investment Specialist at First Center Investors. And uh, in, instead of focusing more on broader area of nature, uh, we're going to, this, this presentation will focus uh, mostly on what we're doing on deforestation. So before I get into this, uh, our journey so far, I think I, sh I should introduce a little bit about First Center Investors. We're a global asset manager um, uh, with about 215 Australian billion dollars of assets under management as of December 22 last year. Um, we have presence in APEC, EMEA, and North America. And we invest in publicly listed equities, fixed income securities, listed, unlisted infrastructure, as well as multi-asset solutions. So um, as an asset manager, uh, why, what have we been doing on, on nature broadly? And also what have we been doing um, on, on deforestation? So I prepared this slide just to give you a sense of what we've been doing. We selected biodiversity as the key priority area in 2020, and we established the position in deforestation in our policy document. And we started doing some mapping analysis, and particularly uh, we started engaging with commercial and domestic washing machine manufacturers on the issue of plastic microfiber pollution. So this is not so much about deforestation, but more generally on nature. In 2021, we continued to engage with these companies, um, but also we established the uh, um, FSI MUTD, which is our parent company, a Sustainable in Investment Institute. And that institute so far has been focusing again on plastic pollution issues. And at the same time in 2021, we signed on to the Finance for Biodiversity Pledge. And 2022, last year, um, I joined the firm last year, early last year, and uh, we launched the Internal Natural Capital and Biodiversity Working Group. And this was the beginning of really, uh, uh, as, as a group and with all of our investment teams, really start to think, think about what we can do on deforestation. We started doing some assessments of our exposure and risk. And the primary purpose of doing that was to come up with a list of priority companies for engagement, as, as others have mentioned. All of the tools that mentioned uh, that were mentioned in this call have been really, really helpful. And the goal is to uh, um, launch uh, uh, natural capital and biodiversity toolkit 
that's uh, first and foremost for internal purpose for to to help guide our investment teams on on engagement and assessment. But also we're looking at uh, publishing some bits of that that toolkit for uh, to to share our lessons learned and our approaches with our external stakeholders. So why focus on deforestation? Um, ben has covered in detail, so I'm not going to go into detail. Uh, number one, I think we covered it well. But number two, uh, it you know, it, deforestation touches on many uh, important economic sectors, and we are investing in some of these companies operating the sectors, such as infrastructure, agriculture, food, uh, textiles, you name it. So because of that, there's a, a direct tie with, with our investment performance. That's why it's important. Number three, I think it's really also important for investors because we can do so much about many different nature-related issues, but if we don't have the right tools, metrics, or resources, to, to assess, uh, it's very difficult for investors to jump into this topic. So I think the availability of these tools are really, really helpful for, for investors to uh, look into it further on our own. And also uh, compared to other nature related issues, because there are so many problems out there, I would say it's, it's got relatively straightforward uh, engagement ask for companies. And because of that, there are many other financial institutions who, are, who have made commitments, time bound commitments to um, set up policies and also to restrict their lending or to, to uh, uh, adjust their investment policies, decision making process, et cetera. And finally, uh, regulation won't come in. So uh, bec because of this and because deforestation can be also a very broad issue on its own, um, um, we decided to first focus on agriculture driven soft commodities um, that are contributing to deforestation, which are these uh, six. And this is also the same uh, type of soft commodities that are um, highlighted in the, in the global canopies uh, finance sector roadmap. Um, so what we are focusing on in terms of our, the, this is the kind of the, the content of the toolkit that we're working on, which focuses on assessment and engagement. As you can see in the text here that we are looking at these sectors because we, we know that they're dependent um, and, and, and they drive deforestation. So these are the sectors that we focus on. So first level will be doing the sector level assessment to understand our exposure, dependencies, and impacts. And then we use five, uh, tools like Forest 500 and Trace Tool and others to narrow down the, the key important material companies. And uh, we, based on that, we would do company level assessment. Uh, I think the company level assessment is really, really important. Um, and we there uh, in the toolkit, we include what are the general principles that investment teams have to know? Um, why is it important to focus on supply chain and location information? And how to actually do this assessment at a company level step by step? Um, because investment managers, portfolio managers have many other important things to do. So we want to really lay out very clear, clearly how to do this assessment. And when they do that, the key question that's going to come up is like, where do we get the data? So I think the data part is really, really important. So uh, we try to list out uh, uh, key sources of data where possible. I mean, not everything will have the right kind of data information available, but where, wherever we know, we try to link that uh, so that it becomes a little bit easier and tangible. And also the toolkit provides some company examples and best practices uh, that, that we know that we can share with uh, investment teams so they can also share that information with investing companies. And then using that information, we, we want our investment teams to use it to engage with, with companies. And I'm gonna get into more detail in the next slide what that means because we have an engagement framework set up. And then this whole, all of this will be uh, um, uh, followed up by uh, capturing examples, reporting, and also progress monitoring. So I mentioned the engagement framework. So this is uh, the uh, framework that we've set up for engagement. And this is largely based on, uh, again, the finance sector roadmap by Global Canopy. Traceability, I think it's really, really key. Um, and we really want uh, to focus on uh, companies to look into their supply chain uh, first year and beyond, and also to disclose more of the location information. Uh, sourcing is another really critical component. Um, uh, what kind of uh, proportion of volumes of each forest uh, risk community, uh, commodity produced, sourced uh, by the company, and how are they certified by th third parties? And how is the company restricting sourcing to certain geographic locations or countries based on deforestation risk? Monitoring um, has to do with how the company is monitoring their performance, also good performance, but also non-compliance issues, and how their monitoring is also important because there's more and more uh, emerging special data um, uh, data tools out there. And policies and pledges, as uh, Ben and others have mentioned, this is 
this is definitely the area that we are already looking into. We ask for policies, we ask for targets. We also ask if they, the company has any uh, grievance mechanisms in case of non-compliant cases and also disclosure. Um, it will be uh, really important to uh, understand from uh, investor, investor's perspective, what is the percentage of commodity volume that is traceable and per each community type and how are they reporting uh, um, these assessment on material high risk soft commodities and their sourcing locations? Um, how are they disclosing uh, controversies and all the rest of these four areas and how the general level of disclosure and transparency level will be really important. So uh, next steps, uh, based on this, we want to uh, finalize the, the toolkit for internal purpose. And as I mentioned, we want to also publish this uh, kind of a summary toolkit for uh, external stakeholders um, in, in a few months. And we definitely want to conduct more analysis, um, deforestation further deeper, but also into other areas. And we want to uh, kind of build on this and actually use this toolkit to uh, use it for collaborative engagement on deforestation uh, with a few components that are material to our portfolios. And then we want to update our firm level position statement on deforestation going forward. So um, this up to where we are right now, this requires lots of back and forth discussions with our investment teams and really getting to know their needs and challenges as much as the responsible investment team that I belong to telling them why the issues are important, what the issues are about. So it was kind of a both way, two way conversation that took place, in, I think, the duration of the whole of last year. So the lessons learned from from that process is like building the base knowledge on nature and setting up the right process for investment is really important. Um, working side to side with investment teams and guiding them with practical information, as I mentioned, the data is really important. And also some of the metrics, uh, what kind of tools that they can use, because Solely, just to solely rely on third-party ESG data providers, it's, I think I, I think right now it's a bit limited. That's why we need to uh, look broader to other think tanks and NGOs and other nonprofit uh, organizations that are providing other quality information. Um, and connecting this to uh, company engagement and um, really clearly communicating our ask, I think it will be really important. Uh, we are trying to bring that component into our toolkit so that we, our investment teams can use it to clearly uh, um, explain, you know, these are the questions that we're asking you to, to invest in companies. And then also these are the asks that we would like to see. You know, and also we want to keep monitoring the, their progress over time. Um, I think that's what we have. So uh, thanks very much. I'll stop sharing. Thanks so much, Joanne. It's so uh, interesting and helpful to have your perspective as somebody who has applied these tools and data in the investment uh, environment. Um, so yes, thank you very much to all the speakers for your presentations. Uh, that has been really sort of interesting. And uh, we are now at the Q&A session of our webinar. Very pleased to say that uh, there are plenty of questions. And because this is like, these presenters have been like a moderator's dream, right? Like completely sticking to time. Uh, we have plenty of question of time in which to take them. So that's great. Um, so I'm just going to look now in the Q&A box and uh, try and pick up some themes. I see some questions, I guess the inevitable questions about the kinds of data that are available and their limitations. So we have a question from uh, Sajiv Mohan Kumar. How can one go from using secondary data such as tax records, etc., towards more location specific and representative sourcing area activity of corporates and FIs. We have seen more disclosure on this in greenhouse gas accounting and in SBTI submissions, but what are some of the barriers that prevent this within finance and any solutions to improve the process? Um, we've also had a question from Surajit Ayer. I hope I pronounced your name right. Um, it's a three-part question, but the third part is also relevant to this about data, asking about um, how can we improve disclosures in the absence of mandatory disclosure um, on climate deforestation and nature. So um, this seems to me some like something all three of you could answer. So I'm not sure if anyone wants to take this first. Moving to more granular data, improving disclosure, and do we need to consider mandatory disclosure? Um, um I, I can just give, give it a go. Um, 
I, I know a lot of database um, databases that are provided by third party provi ESG providers um, that are not for free. So um, I think the quality of the data is becoming really much, much better um, quite quickly. But the problem is it's kind of hidden uh, from the public uh, domain. So sometimes, unless I, I reach out to them and say, oh, we are actually interested in purchase your data, can I have a demo session? It's difficult to really access that data. In the public domain, I, I also see more developments there. Uh, one, I think, great example is the Spatial uh, Finance Initiative Geo uh, Asset Databases. Um, they are covering uh, cement sector and steel sector, I believe, but I think they, the coverage is expanding more. And there are others um, that are also trying to, to provide so coverage, but usually they're sector-based. So oil and gas utilities, these are more physical assets, so I think they tend to have a better coverage of the location-specific data. But for others, like you know, factories, you don't know from uh, looking at the satellite imagery what is actually going on inside the factory. So it's a bit, bit more, more difficult for others. But I, I, I see for, uh, uh, at least for the, the factory base or the power plants, uh, large uh, physical asset base or infrastructure um, um, databases, I think they're uh, largely improving. So um, we, we get this question a lot because when we ask the, the companies about location specific data, they would say, oh, we, we, we are not disclosing it or we haven't started measuring it. We don't really know where, you know, what to include, what to disclose, et cetera, et cetera. And one way now we can say is that, hey, we actually have your data of the locations through this other um, third party or other NGO uh, driven databases. Then once we, they know that we have it, it's much easier to continue the discussion. And they're, I think, more willing to disclose and share information with us. If I can just add some perspective on the bank side. Uh, so uh, as, as Joanna mentioned, uh, you know, banks don't systematically cover this, uh, collect the location specific data for their clients as well. And, and this is a big gap when we move from climate related risk to, to nature related risk, because as we know, for all the nature related risks, uh, most of them are location specific. So um, when we speak to banks, uh, also given the fact that th they've they've made their carbon commitments and they're busy uh, with climate change, uh, there's always a little bit of pushback on, you know, when, you know, having the, the focus and time to do this. So what what the approach that they tend to use is, can we start at least looking at the overall portfolio and identify the main uh, the main nature related risks to focus on. So that's one stream of work. And then the second stream of work is to build the capability to integrate this location specific capability, uh, risk capability into their overall systems, which, which will be needed uh, going forward once the uh, nature related commitments um, are made by banks as well. Jo Jolene, do you want me to cover some of the other banking related questions that Surajit asked as well? Uh, let's finish. Let's round up on this data question first. Just check in if Ben has anything to say about that. Yeah, I, I think uh, touching on the point about like mandatory um, reporting, I think the two things kind of move hand in hand in a way. So the EU regulations, for example, are sort of requiring um, flows linked to a specific plot of land. So it'd be interesting to see how that kind of moves forward the transparency reporting and creates fresh data um, moving forward. Um, but there's also then the kind of the issues about kind of um, a kind of a twin track uh, risk where sort of certain pockets become uh, very well identified and linked to the biggest uh, European exporters, but um, you know another section of the market become is is far more opaque, where most of the risks still reside. Great, thanks, uh, thanks to all for that. And um, yes, you're right, uh, Ashish. There were several more questions from Surajit. I just uh, hived off the data question for now, but but great if you could answer some of the other questions. So for the benefit of the. Uh, attendees who may not have read it, just to say that Surajit asked, um, when we say that banks need to consider nature risk, does that mean to integrate it into the conventional credit appraisal and risk management process so that it's part of credit risk rating itself? Or does that mean to consider it an add-on uh, where there may be some conditionalities that are added separately from credit risk processes? Um, and he's also asked about whether um, there are examples of countries where the banking sector in general has moved ahead on nature, biodiversity, and deforestation without regulatory or policy support from authorities. 
So um, yeah, Sheesh, if you'd like to take that, that'd be great. Sure. Uh, so on the risk appraisal system, uh, you know, in an ideal uh, in an ideal scenario, uh, we would want uh, what you described here, which is um, that the nature related risks are assessed and they make its way right into the probability of default. So traditionally, banks look at uh, the financial uh, capability of their client, uh, they overlay it with a behavioral scorecard, and they come up with a probability of default. And the, the issue is that there isn't enough data sometimes to basically backtest some of the environmental and social issues and, and put it right in. So then what banks do is they use the second best approach, which is to have some sort of a classification system on environmental and social risk on a client by client basis. And then they use that to as a supplement uh, to their credit assessment, which is where most of the banks are right now, uh, particularly the ones who are, who are performing well. Uh, but what we find is that a lot of banks in Asia, uh, what they're doing is doing the third uh, uh, approach, which is using an exclusionary approach, which works well for areas like no deforestation or uh, no funding of coal-fired power plants. But when we want to uh, get banks to engage with their clients to improve, they have to deal with the classification mechanism and work with them and engage with them to improve. So we really want, what we are really asking them to do is at least go for that second category where you do a, a environmental and risk assessment for every client and you classify them and you work with them to improve. So that is, that is really, really important. Uh, in terms of what we've seen is uh, your you're right, uh, there are some European banks which are doing uh, a good job of it, but there are no countries that have really uh, completely um, implemented this uh, on a nature uh, level. And that's probably because the nature conversation uh, like TNFD is still behind where, where TCFD was, uh, where TCFD is today, where most of the banks have made more progress on the climate related front. So uh, to answer the second question, I don't think there's any particular country, or, although we do find some banks in Europe uh, making more progress. And I think uh, that relates to some of the, the your third point on disclosures. I think it's really important to work with regulators as well. So part of our sustainable finance team um, also works with the regulators. Uh, and we have another report out on SUSREG, which engages with them uh, to make sure that uh, they raise uh, the playing field for all, for all parties. So we don't have this problem uh, that um, James was talking about where, you know, there's only one part of, uh, you know, certain parts which are large clients, you know, which are being funded by big banks get covered, but but there's this other uh, sector which is which is completely, um, um, you know, not not sustainable. So uh, that's what I would say on the the third part. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Ashish. Um, ben, Joanne, do you have any thoughts or reflections you would like to add to on those questions? I was just writing in a comment actually. Uh, um, I think the I didn't finish it, but I think the front the French law article twenty nine that requires uh, financial institutions to disclose biodiversity related information. Um, I think biodiversity related risks and impacts. I'm not sure if it includes dependencies and opportunities as well. But because because that dis it's focusing on disclosure, but because it's there, I think um, in France compared to other European countries, I think the the value chain of various nature-related consultancies and knowledge banks and everything, it's, I think it's much more developed than other countries because that kind of law is really driving uh, more companies and more financial institutions to really look into it. I think that's part of the reason why um, the biodiversity footprinting methodologies and mechanisms that's really hotly debated and discussed right now, I think most of them, if you look at it, they're France-based, if I may. Thanks, Joanne. Ben, do you have anything to add? Yeah, no, just to echo that last point, really. So, I mean, we've got the um, the EU sustainability finance disclosure regulations and the US uh, SEC proposals that are kind of bringing in um, the need to disclose risks that can be um, reasonably likely to have material impact. So I think, you know, over the next couple of years, we could start to see um, these firming up in terms of um, disclosures, um, particularly relating to green finance, but also more broadly. Another thing I, I could notice that, you know, because uh, we're an asset manager, we have funds and that are, uh, we have to, uh, that are applied by the SFDR, the uh, Finance Disclosure Regulation. And there, I think um, we have to disclose at a fund level, principal adverse um, um, indicators, impact indicators, PAI, or some people call it PASI, right? And one of the, the indicators we need to disclose at a fund level is biodiversity sensitive area. 
Um, but when you actually look into the, the, the data points that are used to, to disclose that information, usually it comes back to deforestation because that's the, the area where there's mo most amount of data. I would say probably the best quality of data compared to others. So it comes down to like, oh, do you have any physical access or investments or financing um, in those areas where there are primary forests, for example, uh, stuff like that. So this is already happening and we're already looking into this. And I'm sure by next year, if we're going to have another webinar like this, we're going to have a lot more updates on this. Thanks. Um, so we're now looking down the questions. We've got a few questions about different sources of finance. Uh, from an anonymous attendee. Uh, so anonymous attendee writes that uh, they've heard that one of the biggest finance sector links to deforestation in the palm oil sector is lending from national, regional, regional and local banks, often backed by government finance. How much of a role does this type of finance play and what levers are there to encourage due diligence on those investments? Uh, any thoughts from the panel? Yeah, I mean, that's, a, that's a, a great point. And I think the focus tends to be on the kind of the, the major sort of US and European banks and asset managers. But for a, a lot of these sectors, um, a large part of the sourcing will be uh, local players, particularly bank lending will be um, dominated by uh, domestic lenders that maybe aren't quite so well covered by some of these um, current emerging uh, regulations. So I think that's kind of like a... A kind of a key areas how how do um how does progress kind of uh taking the the, the, the kind of the, the the whole global system including um domestic based finance um thanks ben um joanne ashish anything to add on this no uh, we had a similar question about sources of finance from, again, from an anonymous attendee asking about informal financing, specifically what they refer to as Fei Tian, flying money and hawala in Southeast Asia's forest related commodity sector. Uh, and the question is whether, how large is this and how, how problematic is it? Um, I don't know if there's any views or responses to this question. I don't have a sense of size, but I it, it is a big problem. And I think therefore covering the client supply chains is really important because it's very easy to hide um, you know, the issue within the supply chain and, and have those uh, uh, funded uh, through other funds, uh, through other sources of funding. So uh, th that's, I think it, it creates the business case for, for covering the entire client supply chains. Jolene, we can't hear you. Apologies. Um, so one other question in the Q&A box from Naoko Takahashi. Uh, what do you think is missing as a tool or standard to foster deforestation-free supply chains from an investor point of view? So I guess what, what more would we like to see in the ecosystem? And maybe, Joanne, this would be a good one for you to, to take. Yeah, this is a great question. Um... I don't know, maybe I'm talking about a very ideal world, but it'd be really good if there's like one place where we can just like plug in our portfolio and it just gives us like all the information about supply chain. But right now there's, that kind of thing does not exist. So it's, it's difficult. And especially if we are, we're talking about um, um, quantitative um, funds um, that have usually uh, thousands of uh, companies in the holdings of, of a fund, it's very difficult for us to really track down the supply chain information. Uh, company for company and for for large companies like Nestle and others, you know, usually there may, there tends to be more information. But if you start to look at smaller companies and companies that are outside English based information, it becomes harder harder to to get the the information. That's why I think we're thinking at looking at different ways to go around it because we we are learning that just by relying one hundred percent on co corporate voluntary reporting, we're not going to get there very fast. We're not gonna not going to have a quality uh, information that we want to have. So there's satellite imagery, there's third-party databases, there are other ways that are there are players out there that are really focusing on improving that data set, uh, you know, first and foremost. So I think working together with those uh, players 
um, who are making the tools, but also making the providing the data, improving the data. I think it's it's all going to be really helpful. The other thing that I think uh, would be really good is when it comes to deforestation, we're looking at the, our goal is deforestation free, conversion free, and also without any human rights abuse. So linking all these things together, uh, looking more broadly, uh, you know, palm oil is, is one issue that's really connected to deforestation, but looking more broadly than that, um, and also bringing the human rights aspect, you bring in, you know, forced labor, modern slavery, the issue becomes even more complex. So kind of understanding these issues in a holistic manner, and also you, you have to not ignore climate change, right? That, that all, all together, looking at this uh, in a holistic way, um, uh, one company as an investor, I think that's currently very, very difficult. And if you expand that into thousands of companies, doing an accurate uh, level of analysis is currently impossible. But you know, everyone's saying that you know, do not let the perfect be the enemy of good. So we're trying to see where we can actually tackle, you know, even if it's, it may not be perfect, what, what is the thing that we can do right now? So this is the area we're focusing on to, to address in the, in the toolkit. Thanks, Joanne. Um, is there anything that you'd like to add to that, Shush, Ben? No, I, thank you. Yeah, not really. Other than just uh, sort of echo, I think it's the kind of the, the challenge at the moment for uh, investors is, is typically the, the downstream element because like the fidelity of the data gets um, weaker the further up the chain you get. So um, it's currently having to rely on sort of like greater levels of abstraction the, uh, the further up the chain you go. So I think that's kind of one area where, again, we're kind of like it's kind of a hand in hand process where um, increased reporting requirements and regulations will go hand in hand with improvements in data quality so i think we'll probably see sort of like hopefully sort of better quality uh data emerge over the next couple of years along with tighter requirements uh i think we probably have time for this other question that's come in now in the q a box from surajit Aya about the cost of tools um, asking to what extent the subscription cost of tools for banks would, would be an inhibitor to growth. So um, Surajit suggests that Singapore, Hong Kong or Korean banks may be able to pay higher price points, but banks in markets like India or Indonesia might not be able to pay that higher price. Um, they, he has seen that feedback from banks that he works with. How, how can these tools be made more affordable to banks in such markets which have large populations, large GDP, and are highly climate vulnerable. Any thoughts on this from the panel? Can you start talking about the cost of the tools, like like subscription-based tools and databases? I think that's the question, yes. I think it really, really depends on um, the, the viewpoints that a company has or financial institution has and how, how much materiality that they see uh, for them to really understand this issue based on their portfolio lending, loan portfolios. And if they see this as something they really, really need to understand that hence they need a little bit of investment, maybe you know the cost that may seem a little bit prohibitive at, at in the beginning may be a, a very good investment in the long term. Or uh, if they see, okay, maybe right now we are not ready to spend, I don't know, I'm just picking a number, $100,000 on something, but let's let's just focus, start from something that's publicly available for now. See what we can do with that, and then increase our, our our exposure to to use better tools. Because you need some knowledge and resources to actually utilize these tools really well. You can't just like put anyone who has no knowledge and just like ask them to use the tools. So uh, I, I you can also take that kind of step by step approach. Yeah, if, if I can add uh, to, to that comment, and I completely agree with uh, Joanne, I think the, you know, I think there is a lot of open source uh, uh, data that is coming, uh, that is being released, I think, uh, which is going to be useful for um, a lot of the financial institutions. I think the critical bottleneck is the capability building. So I do feel there that, that the regulators and also the banking associations play a role to build that capability. So for example, on the climate side, uh, we had in Malaysia, um, you know, the, the regulator was working uh, along with some banks and some third party 
um, um, knowledge providers to to map out financed emissions. This was a few years ago in the climate context, which really helped them build that capability to do the assessment. And I think we'll need something similar for the for the nature side as well. So I think capability building is really important. And I, lastly, I think this is not just an issue for banks, but particularly for palm oil, uh, palm oil, it's also an issue for smallholders where they may not have the resources to build the capability for traceability. So there again, there's an ask to, to how do we fund that? So for example, in WWF, you know, there's a fundraising effort going on to see how we can uh, develop some of these uh, traceability tools uh, and uh, get smallholders to be certified as well through them. So I think that's another area we, that we also make must make sure we cover. So we, we don't want a situation where only the large companies can comply with these uh, regulations. Absolutely. All right. Uh, thank you very much uh, to the panel for um, taking these questions. And uh, thank you also to everyone who's attended uh, for all the sort of provocative and interesting questions that you have posed. Um, really, really great to be hearing these presentations and uh, this discussion. So thank thanks to everybody for taking the time out. Um, just to say that uh, there's a couple of things um, to cover here, just to say that if you're interested in looking at the trace data that Ben has described, you can find the data at trace, that's T-R-A-S-E dot earth. Uh, and if you have any questions for us, please don't hesitate to email them to info at trace dot earth. A reminder that we will be sharing the recording from this session uh, with everyone who has registered in a couple of days, and that will also be going up on the Trace YouTube. So if it's of interest to you and you think that colleagues or others might be interested, please do share that link. Um, I'm also just going to highlight that we are having an introduction to Trace webinar, which is aimed uh, again at Asian time zones on the 23rd of March. And this will also come with simultaneous translation into Mandarin. So if anybody wants to attend that, uh, please do register and we can have a deeper dive into the trace data methodology. And perhaps that will answer some of the questions as well that have been raised about exactly what kind of data is out there. Um, yes, yeah, so once again, thank you very much to everybody for coming, joining, discussing, participating. Um, this is, you know, well, the conversation's only beginning. There's obviously a lot much more that we need to we need to explore. Um, so please stay in touch. Uh, thank you very much, Jolene. Thanks for all the audience. Thank Bye. you. Thanks, Jolene.